Well, just as we as we've chosen u uh, to be in this direction, that also corresponds to the l direction on the sky. They point in the same direction. Um, and w, you'll recall, is also the one minus l squared minus m squared square root uh, term in our source direction. Uh, the only term that we can't see here because we chose this baseline so that it had no v is the m direction on the sky is is going to be uh, into and out of the page here. But if we look at this phase term, this is really just the equation for a sine wave on the sky that has a unity phase here, uh, that is uh, one in the real component and zero in the imaginary component, where u uh, or l are zero. And so because we've chosen the phase center to be the center of our coordinates, uh, that is where l is zero right here, this is the zero point, uh, then the response of this baseline is going to look like a sine wave across the sky as we go in L and M. So here I've drawn a somewhat homely sine wave on the sky that represents, uh, say, the real component of the complex response of this interferometer on the sky in the L direction. And similarly, if this baseline had any projection along the V direction, we would have some sine wave along the uh, M direction on the sky. Uh, and so there's a sine wave, and of course the imaginary component will be out of phase with this because one's a sine and one's a cosine uh, when you do e to the minus 2 pi i. Uh, but this sine wave on the sky is something inherent to the response of this baseline, and it's called the fringe pattern on the sky. Now I just said sine wave across the sky, but there's something that is worth noting here, um, and that's the fact that L and M are not angles on the sky. L is actually the sine of an angle in the east-west direction, and M is the sine of an angle in the north-south direction. And something else to note is that as u and v increase, that is that your baseline gets longer, the frequency of the sine wave as a function of L and M increases. So the longer your baseline is, the tighter the sine wave, this fringe pattern on the sky, is going to be. So I move these antennas twice as far away, this, this sine, is, sine wave is going to go through uh, twice as many uh, periods across the sky as it does uh, here. And similarly, if I move these antennas close together, uh, I'll have a much broader sine wave on the sky. And this is all to say that the resolution, the, the size of features that you can pick up with this sine wave on the sky is dependent upon how far apart you've placed your antennas. And this is why uh, we often use an interferometer, is because we can put two antennas at very large spacings and get much better resolution on the sky. We can have a much tighter sine wave on the sky uh, than we could if we had to fill in the entire area between these two antennas with metal. So this picture right here is one way of understanding for uh, just two antennas on the ground uh, how they respond to the sky. Uh, we could paint a sky on here, choose a, an A uh, primary beam and an I, uh, the distribution of, of flux density on the sky, and uh, by painting this, this uh, fringe pattern on the sky, we can say what the response of this baseline is going to be at any given U, V, and W. Now what I'm going to do is actually just give a intuitive understanding of what's going on here that gets away from choosing any particular two pairs of antennas and instead kind of holistically looks at the process of sampling the sky with many antennas uh, all together in an array and talking about the response of that entire array. And I'm going to clear out a little space here and I'm going to 
to erase up to this equation that we have up here where I've bracketed the W term. And so we recall that this is still a Fourier transform. We've just neglected one of the terms here and uh, we'll, we'll visit that term later, but it's multiplied by the rest of what we do. So worst case scenario, we have a Fourier transform here, and because we have a product inside of the Fourier transform, that's the same as a convolution outside of it. So uh, the fact that I'm erasing this and ignoring this term for now doesn't change the fact that this is a Fourier transform, even if there's a function convolving it that we haven't discussed yet. I'm also, now that I've erased and got some room, going to remind you that this uh, bracketed term here uh, was the perceived sky. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about everything in terms of the perceived sky right now because uh, it's just a little too much detail to track primary beam responses through all of this. So I'll begin by drawing a dotted line down the middle of the page here. And on one side here, I'm going to draw a big two-dimensional uh, picture of the sky. So we'll call this the sky. Um, and I'm going to draw the Big Dipper on here for fun. We know that if this is the sky, and we'll actually just say that this is the perceived sky, then the Fourier transform of that, which goes across to the other side of the page, transforms our L and M coordinates on the sky to U and V coordinates. Uh, so the Fourier transform of the sky has coordinates of U and V. Uh, creatively, it's called the UV plane. And that UV plane is what an interferometer with coordinates of U and V, and we ignored the W component. So U and V are baseline length. This is what uh, a baseline in an array, a pair of antennas, samples is the UV plane. And I'm going to draw this so that U of 0, V of 0 is right here in the middle. So I've written that this is the UV plane here, but I should clarify that this is the true UV plane. Uh, if we had a whole bunch of antennas covering an entire field and we covered every, every piece of that field, we might be able to sample every U and V and recover the true UV plane. But in practice, that just doesn't happen. So let's suppose for a minute that we only have three antennas in a field. I'll label them A, B, and C. Now if we want to keep track of all the baselines that we have there, I'm going to draw the interferometric sampling of this array. So this is what the sampling of the UV plane is going to look like. Uh, so if we draw a vector from A to B, that points to right up here. That's one of the samples we'll get. A to C will point straight to the left. Uh, and B to C will point down. Um, and uh, I, I will also put a little circle here in the middle to show that um, a, a, A is actually a baseline, an antenna with itself, and that samples the center of the UV plane at U0, V0, and, and BB also samples there, and CC does as well. Uh, so we, other than these, which are called autocorrelations, uh, we have three uh, samples of the UV plane here. But I chose to measure A to B. But in fact, B to A is a perfectly valid sample as well. So why did I draw a dot up here and not down here uh, for a vector pointing the opposite direction? And the fact is that I actually can. I do get that sample. Um, but it's not an independent piece of information. So maybe I should color this a different color. I'm going to color it orange. 
that the orange samples here are reflections of the baseline. So if this was AB, then BA is over here. But they don't have independent information. And the reason is that the sky here is real valued. Uh, we don't get complex waves from the sky. We get real valued electric waves, uh, electric fields that come in. And the uh, the consequence of that, for knowing that we have a real valued sky, is that uh, for any uh, coordinate, any spatial frequency, which is what U and V are, for any spatial frequency out here, uh, the corresponding negative frequency, the value that you measure in it, has to be the complex conjugate of what you'd measure at a positive frequency. And that's just what happens when you take Fourier transforms of real valued signals. So if I measured V over here, then it's absolutely true for a real valued sky that I would have to measure V conjugate over here, V star. So it, for any baseline that I measure, V, I can put two points on this UV plane, one at the U and V coordinates of the baseline in one direction, and one at the minus U and minus V coordinates uh, in the other direction, uh, but the catch is I have to conjugate my visibility if I were going to put it there. So a baseline at minus u minus v, which is just pairing your antennas backwards, will have a conjugate value coming out of your correlator than if you uh, correlate a with b. So b with a and a with b come out with a different conjugation out of your correlator depending on the order that you correlate them. But uh, for whatever you get out of the correlator, you can always put the other uh, sample down. Now one last little cute thing here is, uh, just as a, a bit of an aside, that we went from the distribution of antennas on a field here, A, B, and C, to the UV sampling pattern. Now it turns out you, if you want to calculate this fast, uh, faster than what we just did, which was pairing every antenna with every other antenna, you could just make a little matrix here, put down your antenna positions as dots in that matrix, and then convolve that matrix with itself. And what that does is it slides A and B and C uh, by a copy of itself. And any place where A and B or A and C or B and C line up, it's going to put a dot at that separation. So. Uh, interestingly, the UV sampling of an array is just the convolution of the distribution of antennas in a field with itself. So now we have our true UV plane, which is a Fourier transform of the perceived sky, and we have uh, our UV sampling pattern, which reflects that for any array that we have, we don't get all of the information in the UV plane. So those combined suggest that what we truly measure here is a sampled UV plane where we've put in at each U and V coordinate and at each minus U and minus V coordinate the visibility that we measured uh, on our interferometer out of our correlator. And everywhere else uh, we've just put zero because we have no information about any U and V of the true UV plane that we haven't sampled with our the inherent UV sampling of our array. So we have incomplete information, but we might as well just go ahead and do the Fourier transform of our sampled UV plane and see what we get. And what we're going to get is something that looks like our true sky. You'll see something that looks like the Big Dipper here, but around each point here, uh, we're going to have little things coming out. It's going to look a little grungy. These are called side lobes. So this is a, a grungy, it's a dirty view of the sky, and in fact this is often called the dirty image. The dirty image is the direct inverse transform of the sampled UV plane. So why do we not get back our perfect sky? Well, we lost information. What we did is we took the true UV plane, which is what you can Fourier transform to get your sky back, and we multiplied it by our UV sampling pattern. 